From 1759 to 1778, Ferney, a small community in the southeast portion of France, just north of Geneva, Switzerland, was home to French writer and philosopher Voltaire. He influenced the town so much that it was renamed Ferny Voltaire in 1791. The writer built the local church and founded cottage industries that produced some of the finest potters and watchmakers of modern France. Ferny Voltaire today is a popular community due to its close proximity to Geneva, which is home to the European Organization for Nuclear Research, the World Health Organization, and the Office of the United Nations. Jean-Claude Romand was a con man living in Ferny Voltaire when his world of deceit came crashing down around him. It was there that he decided to end it all in a fiery blaze that would absolve him of all of the crimes he had committed. This is Monsters. The Ramon family lived in the Jura Mountains in eastern France, just barely touching the border of Switzerland. Amy Ramon was a prisoner of war at a German stalag for five years in World War II before returning home where he started running his father's timber company. He married Anne-Marie not long after. Jean-Claude Ramon was born on February 11, 1954. His parents wanted more children, but Anne-Marie was hospitalized twice with extra-uterine pregnancies. Also called an ectopic pregnancy, this is when the fertilized egg implants itself somewhere outside of the uterus, most cases in the fallopian tube. It can lead to a ruptured fallopian tube or other organ damage. Anne-Marie had to have surgery both times to remove the egg, and during the second surgery, she also had a hysterectomy. Jean-Claude lived in a small village on a family farm after he was born before his family moved to the nearby town of clairvaux le lac while growing up, he learned from his family that you shouldn't say or do anything that could upset someone else. He knew that his mother felt sorrow for the fact that she couldn't have any more children, and that if he also showed any unhappiness of his lack of brothers and sisters, it would cause her more sorrow, so he held his feelings in. Later in court, Jean-Claude would talk about a number of his pet dogs, one who he used as a confidant while he was a child. He would tell the dog anything without worry that he would upset the animal. He explained that one day the dog disappeared and that he suspected that his father had shot him, either because he was sick or because he had done something wrong. But when he was told the dog must have run away, Jean-Claude assumed that his father was lying in order to not hurt his feelings. His discussion of the dog was one of the few times he showed any real emotion during the trial. Jean-Claude looked up to his father when he was young. He grew up fully intending to get into the timber business as an adult, but it was when he started attending a technical boarding school that he started to turn away from that idea. Most of the kids that attended were the children of doctors and lawyers who turned their noses up at the dirty work of a forest worker. He wanted to be seen in higher regard, so he changed his mind and decided to become a doctor. This was a big deal to Jean-Claude. He loved the idea of working in the forest and actually hated the idea of touching sick people. There have been many assumptions about why he changed his mind about his career, but in court he said it was his last resort to get him the life he wanted. He originally began preparing for the Forestry Commission competitive exam at the boarding school, but a bullying incident embarrassed him enough that he moved back home and took correspondence courses in forestry that his parents had set up for him. He didn't really take them seriously, though, as he was already setting up a plan to enroll in medical school. When Jean-Claude began his first year of medical school, a distant cousin of his, Florence Crowley, was also attending the school. He had known Florence from family gatherings and said that he considered them engaged from the age of 14. The feeling didn't seem to be entirely mutual, though. Florence seemed to be annoyed with his constant presence. She did seem to admire his dedication and loyalty, though, and eventually she broke down. One night in 1975, he told her he loved her, and they consummated their relationship. Afterward, Florence suggested that they take a break from each other. Her reasoning was that she needed to focus on her studies. This caused Jean-Claude to become depressed, but as he learned as a child, he didn't show his emotions to anyone. Whether due to depression or he simply missed his alarm, Jean-Claude never made it to his final exams at the end of his second year of medical school. He scheduled a makeup exam, but he failed to attend that as well. During his trial, he suddenly came up with a story about falling down a flight of stairs and breaking his wrist, which caused him to miss the makeup exam, but that story couldn't be verified. 
I'm not sure how many times you're able to schedule a makeup exam, but if he was able to schedule another one, he didn't. His parents called him later the day of the makeup exam and asked him how it went, to which he said it went fine. This was the point in Jean-Claude's life where he began living a life that wasn't his. The path he was really on split into two and he led people to believe that he was still traveling down the current path. But in reality, he set out on a path that nobody really knew about. This is the part of many cases that fascinates me. In the cases that I've covered that involve someone lying about who they really are and what they're really doing, people who are living fake lives, there's always that one lie, that one indiscretion that sets them off on a path of more and more bigger and bigger lies. For Christian Longo, it was that $108 he stole from his employer to make a payment on an engagement ring. For Neil Entwistle, it was when he told his employer he was quitting due to a family problem. For Jean-Claude Ramond, it was telling people that he had taken his second-year exams. It wasn't the first time he had lied. Earlier in medical school, after Florence had suggested they not see each other, Jean-Claude went out to a nightclub with some friends. During the evening, he disappeared for a couple of hours, and when he returned, he was bloody and his shirt was torn. He told the friends that he had gone out to his car for cigarettes when a group of guys grabbed him and threw him in the trunk of his car. They drove for a while before the group pulled over, beat him up, and then took off, leaving him in the middle of nowhere with his car. He had to find his way back to the club. He said he had no idea why they did it. As crazy as the story sounded, his friends believed him because why would he make that up? They suggested he file a report with the police, and he agreed, but no record of the crime could be found. He admitted during his trial that he made the story up for attention. He must have gone out, scraped up his skin, and tore his own shirt before going back to the club and reporting the crazy story to his friends. After he missed his makeup exam, he waited the three weeks for test scores to be announced. He had three weeks to attempt to fix the problem, but he didn't. Once the test scores were posted, he told his family he had passed and was now a third-year medical student. The school obviously wasn't going to let him become a third-year medical student since he didn't complete his second year, so he signed up as a second-year student again. He spent the first part of his second, second year staying in his apartment. Most people didn't notice Jean-Claude enough to realize that he wasn't around, but one friend did. He showed up at Jean-Claude's apartment with the intention of cheering him up. He assumed that his friend was depressed over his breakup with Florence and was shocked when Jean-Claude told him that he had cancer. He told his friend that he had lymphoma, a form of cancer that attacks the lymphatic system. He chose this since it's common for someone to have it, though not show any outward symptoms. It explained his depression and his absence. He was able to blend this lie in with his first lie, and it created a smooth transition for him to reintegrate back into university life. Soon, Jean-Claude told his friends that his lymphoma was in remission and the lie disappeared as easily as it had come. Florence had also taken pity on him and agreed to get back together with him. Her friends said that she never found him physically attractive, but she felt respect and affection for him. Now, though everyone thought that Jean-Claude was progressing through medical school, he was actually in a perpetual state of being a second-year student. Over the next few years, he sent letters to the school board informing them that a medical condition was keeping him from taking his exams. These letters eventually ended with him not completing his end-of-year exams again and being barred from enrolling in the next year of schooling. It did not, however, bar him from re-enrolling in the second year, which he did, repeatedly, until 1985. He was a second-year medical student for 12 years. He went to lectures, had all of the books that corresponded to the classes he claimed to be in, he had study sessions with friends, compared notes, and crammed for exams with Florence. She was no longer in the same program as him because she had failed her second-year exams. She had changed her major and was now getting a degree in pharmacology. During this time, Jean-Claude did everything he would have done to become a doctor except take the exams. He was lost in the numbers, and every year he received a new student ID and privileges as a second-year student at the school. Jean-Claude and Florence married in 1980 at her parents' house in Annecy. The next year, Florence graduated with a degree in pharmacology and began working part-time at a pharmacy. 
As far as everyone else knew, Jean-Claude had passed his medical board exam in Paris and had begun working as a research assistant at INSERM, the National Institute of Health and Medical Research. The couple would go on to have two children, Caroline, who was born on May 14, 1985, and Antoine, who was born on February 2, 1987. Jean-Claude wasn't satisfied just being a research assistant, albeit a fake one, so he began telling people he had become a research scientist at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Geneva is on a little sliver of Switzerland that pokes into the east border of France. It was only about a 30-minute drive from their house near Ferny Voltaire. He told his family that he was working on medications to treat a condition called arteriosclerosis which is the thickening of the artery walls that happens with age. In order to convince people he worked there, he would bring back gifts for his kids from Geneva. Now, you're probably wondering how his family never tried to call him at work or visit his office. Simple, he told everyone he had a strict policy that separated his work and his personal life. He said that he did not allow co-workers to call or visit him at home, and he didn't allow his own family to call him at work. If they needed to reach him, they had to leave a message with an answering service who, in turn, would page him and he could call his family back. Completely normal. By 1986, the new head of the university had discovered Jean-Claude's 12-year span of being a second-year medical student and requested that he not be able to re-enroll. Then he sent a letter to the eternal medical student requesting a meeting. Jean-Claude did not show up and he never re-enrolled again. By this time, he was married with kids, faking a job in Geneva, Switzerland. After he moved out of the apartment his parents had purchased for him while he was in university, he sold it for 300,000 francs, which he just kept, even though he hadn't paid for the apartment in the first place. He also continued withdrawing money from his parents' accounts. His parents allowed him to take spending money out of their account while he was supposedly in medical school so he could focus on his studies instead of trying to work a part-time job but they either didn't notice or didn't care when he continued taking money after his supposed graduation. Under the guise of going to work at the WHO, Jean-Claude would drop his children off at school and drive into Geneva and park in the parking lot of the WHO. He would use a visitor's pass to go to the on-site library and the conference room. He would pick up any papers that were printed out and left behind. He kept these papers all over his car and house as a sign of where he worked. He would send out mail from the building's post office and use the on-site bank. This gave him bank receipts from the WHO building. He managed to sneak upstairs once to take a picture of an office door, which he told his parents was his office. Once he had built up enough evidence that showed he was an employee of the WHO, he started going to Geneva less often. He'd go to a cafe and read newspapers and scientific journals, taking notes of information to use to keep up his charade. He'd go to parking lots and nap. Sometimes he'd spend the day hiking in the Jura Mountains, admiring the forests that would have been his office had he chosen a different path in life. Jean-Claude also took trips for work. He claimed that he went to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Tokyo, Japan, even bringing gifts back from some of the places he claimed to have traveled, which were really purchased at the gift shop in the airport. In reality, he would drive to the Geneva airport and stay at a nearby hotel. He would spend a few days watching television and studying a travel guide for whatever city he was supposed to be in. During the fake trip, he would call home, telling them what time it was and what the weather was like. Then, he'd return home. Jean-Claude eventually came up with a new plan to bring in money. He told people that, as an international civil servant, he had the ability to make special investments that guaranteed a return of 18%. His parents agreed to put their savings in their son's hands, and Jean-Claude had an uncle who also agreed to invest some money. Then, Florence's father, Pierre, retired and agreed to invest 378,000 francs with his son-in-law. In the late 80s, early 90s, the exchange rate for a franc was about 5 or 6 francs per U.S. dollar. This would make his investment about 70,000 U.S. dollars back then. Adjusting for inflation, that would be about 150,000 U.S. dollars today. When Pierre asked Jean-Claude for some of his investment money back so he could purchase a Mercedes, it was only a few weeks later that the man fell down a flight of stairs and died. Jean-Claude would tell investigators many years later that it was only a coincidence that he and Pierre were alone at the house that day. 
With the money he was taking in the investment scam burning up quickly, Jean-Claude came up with a new scam. Florence had an uncle that had been diagnosed with cancer, and Jean-Claude told her aunt that he was working on a cure at the WHO. He said that it wasn't commercially available yet, and it most likely wouldn't be before the uncle died. He told her that he could probably get a couple of pills, but at this stage in the development, they would be 15,000 francs per pill, and he would need two for the initial treatment. The aunt agreed, and it's unclear what Jean-Claude delivered, probably a placebo, in exchange for the 30,000 francs. A few months later, Jean-Claude said that the uncle needed another treatment and was paid another 30,000 francs. Not long after the death of Pierre, Florence's mother decided to downsize and gave her son-in-law the $1.3 million francs, about 500,000 US dollars today, she had made from the sale of her home. With that money, Jean-Claude purchased a farmhouse in nearby Ferny Voltaire. He also began dating a woman named Corinne Howartine. She was a divorced mother with two kids who had recently moved to the same area. She had been friends with the Roman family for a long time. Three weeks after her divorce, Jean-Claude brought her a bouquet of flowers and asked her out to dinner. He then told her he was in love with her, though she didn't feel the same way. Like with Florence, his persistence wore her down and they ended up dating off and on for a while. She eventually broke it off with him for good and started seeing someone else. When her old apartment sold for 900,000 francs, about 340,000 US dollars today, she asked her ex-boyfriend if he would invest it for her and Jean-Claude was happy to help. He was actually happy to get the money as he was burning through other people's money faster than he could get it. Corinne started having second thoughts about giving all of her money to Jean-Claude. She was uncomfortable not having gotten a deposit slip or any other agreement about the money. She knew that, if something happened to him, she would have a hard time getting her money back since everything was in his name and she had no record of the transaction. She asked him for part of her money back, but he made up excuses and managed to delay for a while. At the same time, there was a scandal at the school that Caroline and Antoine attended in which a married principal was having an affair with one of the teachers. This resulted in the members of the school board voting to demote the principal and Jean-Claude ended up being the only person to fight in the man's defense for some reason. One day, the president of the school board decided he wanted to meet with Jean-Claude and thought the best way to get in touch with him was to call him at work. He looked through the WHO directory but couldn't find him, so he checked the International Pension Fund database and couldn't find him there either. Not thinking much of it, he shrugged it off. A few months later, he ran into Florence and brought up his discovery. She also shrugged it off, but later mentioned it to her husband. This increased the fear in Jean-Claude that his lies were starting to crash down around him. By the end of 1992, Corinne was done being put off. Over dinner in Paris, she told him that she wanted her money back. Jean-Claude knew that he was at the end of the line. Instead of making any more excuses, he agreed to set a date for them to meet where he would hand over her money. He told her he was scheduled to have dinner with Bernard Kochner, the health minister, on January 10th and he invited her to join him. She agreed. Jean-Claude was about to carry out his final move to try to get out from under the massive fraud he had committed against so many people. At the beginning of January 1993, Jean-Claude began collecting supplies for his exit plan. He went to one bank and withdrew 1,000 francs, then went to another and withdrew another 1,000. He purchased a bottle of barbiturates, a stun wand, two pepper spray canisters, a box of 22 caliber ammunition, and a silencer for a 22 caliber rifle. He was actually in denial about his plan at this point, having the purchases gift-wrapped. He told himself that the stun wand and pepper spray were for Corinne because she was afraid when she returned home late at night. The silencer and ammo was for his father. Who buys someone a silencer as a gift? Please, don't answer that in the comments. He purchased two gas cans and something else that cost about 40 francs. It was theorized in court that it was for a rolling pin, but Jean-Claude denied that. He filled the gas tanks at a local fuel station, then went to his parents' house for a visit. He said in court that he already had his father's rifle in his possession, having borrowed it previously, but authorities believed he actually picked it up when he visited his parents this time. Saturday, January 9th, Florence talked to her mother on the phone and, due to her mother being upset over some family drama, Florence was also upset when she got off the phone. 
She and Jean-Claude sat on the couch together, and this is the last thing that he claims to remember. He told authorities that the next thing he knew, he woke up holding a bloody rolling pin. At some point that night, Jean-Claude beat Florence to death with a rolling pin in their bedroom. When he supposedly woke up with the bloody rolling pin in his hand, he said he washed it in the bathroom sink and put it away. Then he went back to bed and slept next to his wife's dead body. When his kids woke up in the morning, he told them that their mother was still asleep and he watched cartoons with them for about an hour. First, he attempted to have them drink water with barbiturates in it, but it sounds like they thought it tasted funny and didn't drink the water. He eventually told the kids that they felt warm and might be getting sick. He took Carolyn up to the bedroom first and told her to lay on her stomach on the bed. Then he shot her in the back with the rifle before covering her body with a blanket. He hid the rifle and called Antoine upstairs where he did the same thing. Jean-Claude put on jeans and an old shirt, but he put his suit and shaving kit in the car. He traveled to his parents' house, and the three of them had dinner. The man had spent time on the couch with his wife before killing her, had spent time watching cartoons with his children before killing them, and then had dinner with his parents before killing them. He was the type of person who could so easily live a life of lies that he was able to be a loving husband, father, and son, even though he knew perfectly well that he was about to kill the people he was with. After dinner, Jean-Claude called his father into his old bedroom so he could look at a broken air vent. When Amy bent down to look at the vent, his son shot him two times in the back. He covered his body with a blanket. Then he brought Marianne into a sitting room, and though he may have tried to get her to look away somehow, it didn't seem to work. She was shot from the front and covered with a blanket. He told authorities that Caroline loved his parents' dog and he wanted her to have him with her, so he shot the dog as well. And yes, he covered the dog with a blanket. Jean-Claude washed off the rifle and put it back where it went in the gun rack at his parents' house. He cleaned up, changed his clothes, and called Corinne to confirm their meeting place before leaving the house. He got to Corinne's apartment and said hello to her daughters while she finished getting ready. Then, with the girls in the care of a babysitter, they left to go to the dinner that we can only assume Jean-Claude fabricated. As soon as they got in the car, she asked for her money. Jean-Claude claimed that he hadn't had time to go to Geneva, but he would be able to get it on Monday. Corinne was annoyed, but accepted the promise and they headed out. On the way there, the directions weren't that great and they had to stop multiple times to try to get their bearings. Eventually, Jean-Claude pulled over at a picnic area and said he needed to look in the trunk of his car for a piece of paper that had Bernard Kochner's phone number on it. He said he was unsuccessful at finding the phone number, but he claimed to have found a necklace he had been meaning to give Corinne. He convinced her to get out of the car so he could put the necklace on her, but instead he sprayed pepper spray in her face and jammed the stun wand into her stomach. Corinne fought with all of her might, pleading with Jean-Claude not to kill her. She said that as soon as she looked directly into his eyes, he stopped his attack. He started telling her to calm down and tried to say that she had started attacking him and he was just defending himself. When she insisted that he had started attacking her unprovoked, he claimed that his cancer had come back and it must have been affecting his mental state. Once a con man, always a con man. Corinne testified in court that she never did see a necklace, but after the attack was over, she saw a length of black cord on the ground that looked like an appropriate weapon to strangle someone with. They decided against going to the dinner, and on the car ride home, she suggested that he see a therapist and told him she could give him a recommendation. When he dropped her off, he asked her not to tell anyone what happened. She agreed as long as she got her money on Monday. After leaving Corinne's apartment, he pulled over five minutes later and called her from a payphone asking her to promise not to believe his actions were premeditated. He told her, quote, If I'd wanted to kill you, I'd have done it in your apartment and I'd have killed your girls too. End quote. He got back to his house in the early morning hours of Sunday, and it wasn't until about 11 a.m. that he worried that someone might see his car in the driveway and stop by to say hello. He drove his car to the parking lot of a nearby supermarket and walked back home. Based on when the programs aired, he spent the hours between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. recording various bits of television over a VHS tape. Jean-Claude claimed in court that he doesn't remember doing it, and it's not known what was on the tape before. After that, he spent the next few hours calling Corinne repeatedly. The phone records show that the first eight calls must have been picked up by her answering machine, but on the ninth time, she picked up. 
He apologized to her again, and she insisted that he find someone to talk to. He agreed. Jean-Claude claimed that he felt like it was finally time to die, so he poured the gasoline from the cans around the house, first in the attic, then on his children and wife's bodies, then down the stairs. He put on his pajamas and then started fires in the attic, stairwell, and his children's bedroom. Then he went into his bedroom and swallowed about 20 capsules of Nebutal. These weren't the barbiturates that he had tried to give his kids. This was a bottle he had had for about 10 years, and it had long since expired. People have questioned why he took these instead of the other barbiturates, but I think it's obvious. Jean-Claude did not want to die. He lit the house on fire. The attic, the stairs, the children's room. Guess which room he didn't light on fire? His and Florence's room. It would have made more sense for him to take the new barbiturates, before he even started pouring the gas to give them time to work, but he didn't. He waited until the last minute and took some old, long-expired pills. Then, when the smoke started coming into the bedroom, he put some clothes against the bottom of the door to seal it up better. Once the firefighters got to the house, he went to the bedroom window and opened it. When the firefighters saw him, they raised their ladder and rescued him just as he lost consciousness. When the fire was put out, the three bodies of Florence, Caroline, and Antoine were brought out of the house. The children's bodies were completely burnt, but Florence was only partially burned. An examination revealed a wound on the back of her head, and it was initially theorized that a beam from the attic must have fallen on her during the fire. An autopsy would reveal that all three had died before the fire. Florence's head wounds were inflicted before the fire and the children died of gunshot wounds. When Jean-Claude's uncle went to break the terrible news to Amy and Anne-Marie, he found them both dead, as well as the dog, from gunshot wounds. This prompted the police to try to find out who would want to harm Jean-Claude and his family. When they learned that he was a researcher at the World Health Organization, they called and asked to speak with someone who worked with Dr. Ramond. The police were informed that there was no Dr. Ramond that worked at the WHO. They checked the National Registry of Physicians and learned that Jean-Claude had never worked as a doctor and had never even finished medical school. They recovered Jean-Claude's car from the parking lot and inside he left a note that read, quote, An ordinary accident, an injustice can bring on madness. Forgive me, Corinne. Forgive me, my friends. Forgive me, good people of St. Vincent School Board who wanted to punch my face in, end quote. Police interviewed Corinne, who told them about the incident on Saturday night. The attack, the pepper spray, the stun gun, and the black cord she saw on the ground. Jean-Claude spent three days in a coma, and when he awoke, he went straight into con man mode. He claimed that a man dressed in black had shot the children and set the house on fire. He said he was too paralyzed with fear to stop him. He was interrogated for seven hours, arguing against every piece of evidence they presented. When they told him that they knew he didn't work for the WHO, he claimed he was actually a consultant who worked for a different company. When the police checked and then told him that company didn't exist, he made up a different story. Nobody knows why, but after seven hours of denying any involvement in the deaths of his family, he finally confessed to everything. Several teams of psychiatrists diagnosed him with narcissistic personality disorder, and he was tried for the murders of his parents, wife, and children in 1996. He made more excuses for why he committed some of his crimes, like charging for the fake cancer treatment. Ultimately, he was convicted to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 22 years. Jean-Claude was a model prisoner, spending 16 years doing full-time work restoring audio archives for a state institution. In his free time, he obtained qualifications in information technology, studied Japanese, philosophy, literature, meditation, and Gregorian chant. He was denied parole in February of 2019 because the magistrates expressed doubts about his pathological personality and the narcissistic and perverse elements that have developed only a little since his incarceration. Jean-Claude claimed to have remorse for what he did and has since found religion. The decision was overruled by a court of appeal two months later and he was released from prison at the end of June of 2019. He had planned to be living in a monastery for two years, allowed to leave but required to be there at night. His movements were monitored by an electronic tag. He is barred from returning to the scene of his crimes or contacting anyone that's been involved.
This man heartlessly murdered his wife and children, then murdered his own parents, their dog, and then planned to murder his ex-mistress. He took the lives of the people who he should have been caring for like it was no big deal. He spent 26 years in prison for it, and it's unlikely that he became a normal human being with a conscience in that time. Those 26 years didn't cure him of being an absolute monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.